Hey guys, I just wanted to cut this in to say the barrel pick is officially available, and if you'd like to get me a Christmas gift this year, get yourself this bottle, and you can justify it to your spouse that way if you'd like. I want to be really candid with you guys because I feel like I can be. Buying this barrel pick is a huge support to the show and to the distillers that we are trying to highlight with these barrel picks. What Hard Truth Distilling is doing with their Sweet Mash Rye in the fact that it tastes like no other rye that I've ever had before, I feel like it deserves the hype and to be put on that pedestal. I think it's worth every penny, and Ryan and I even decided not to add a premium onto this bottle because we know it's not necessarily a cheap bottle, and we want you guys to be able to get your hands on it and feel like you got a killer deal. If you're even considering getting yourself a bottle, I will have a link in the show notes, and I thank you guys in advance for even considering checking it out. All I want for Christmas is for this bad boy to sell out. What makes a good whiskey for the holidays, my picks for the best whiskeys for the holidays, and a review of Jameson Black Barrel. What's up, guys? My name is Chris, and you are listening to the Whiskey Noobs Podcast, and today we're talking all about the best whiskeys for over the holidays. I know it's coming up. A lot of us, hopefully, are going to have some time away from work. We're going to be sitting around with family, enjoying glasses of whatever it is the family drinks, even if it's not alcohol. And a lot of us, those of us who like drinking whiskey, you want something that's going to make that time special. Now, what do I mean by that? What, what do I mean it makes the time special? I don't mean the intoxication. If you've been listening for a while, you know that. You know me well enough to know that. But I do mean that there's a sentimentality associated with whiskey. I actually was just talking about this on a live the other night. Uh, Somebody had asked me about, I forget what the question was. I think it was about not tasting the notes. Um, They actually, yeah, that's what it was. It was about tasting notes and how it's different from like tasting actual caramel or something like that. And I was talking about how when you taste notes, you're actually really tasting what it reminds you of, which lends itself really well to the idea, and I'm a firm believer in this, that a big part of enjoying whiskey is the sentimentality, especially if it's a whiskey that you've had before. Now, I promise I'm reeling it back in here. All of this is to say that when you're sitting around with family, you want a whiskey that you're going to enjoy the taste of, you're going to enjoy the flavor of, and then ideally, later on when you taste that whiskey or smell that whiskey, it has this feeling that it's like the holiday whiskey. Uh, For me, I have one specifically around Christmas time, which we are reviewing today called Jameson Black Barrel, which I have right here. It's not even opened. I just bought this for this episode. I turned it the wrong way. I just bought it for this episode. And it is a very, very Christmas tasting whiskey to me. Actually, and we're going to get into this, the flavor profile isn't overly Christmassy. It's the story behind it that makes it Christmassy for me. Now, that is one reason that something could be a good holiday whiskey. And I want to break down what, in my opinion, makes a good holiday whiskey. So that's reason number one right there. It could be that it has a sentimental value for you. When you smell it, when you taste it, it reminds you of the holidays for some reason. However, there's also characteristics that whiskeys can have that make them holiday-esque. And so I'm, of course, going to be talking about some of those whiskeys as well. That's why this episode isn't just a review of Jameson Black Barrel. I'm also going to be talking about some whiskeys I have sitting off to the side here that, to me, give off holiday flavors. Now, what can that look like? That could look like holiday dessert-esque flavors. It could look like the types of things you smell around the holidays. If it reminds you of a Bath and Body Works holiday candle right off the bat, that's probably a good whiskey uh, for the holidays to remind you of the holidays. And if it's going to have, if it's going, the, the third one is a little bit tough, but if it's going to pair well with the things that you are eating over the holidays, if it's going to be something that you want to sit around and eat your Christmas cookies while you're drinking it, or something that you want to uh, have during your meal, your Christmas meal, or a lot of these even work for Thanksgiving because I kind of group those together, but those are all different ways that they can taste holiday esque. So the first the first characteristic, in my opinion, of a good holiday whiskey is the sentimentality of it. And to me, that's the most important. You can have a whiskey that tastes nothing like anything that I just described, but it when you taste it, it does remind you of the holidays. That's most important. So if you have that, that's great. However, 
if you're looking for a holiday whiskey, because a lot of people like to ask me, you know, what's a good holiday whiskey? I can give you recommendations, and I will give you recommendations, but I don't want you to just blindly accept those recommendations. I want you to know why I'm giving you them. And so then we move into the territory of, does it taste, quote unquote, like the holidays? So that's the, the kind of second camp that, that you can put those things in. For me, those are the two main reasons that something would be a holiday whiskey. Uh, and there, there could be more, and there could be some that are more important to other folks. But to me, those two things, and any one of those two things, can make something a great holiday whiskey. And we're going to talk about both. So we're going to talk about today, of course, I'm going to review this Jameson Black Barrel. So we're going to talk about a whiskey that doesn't really have a lot of holiday-esque notes to it but reminds me specifically of the holidays, and I'll explain why. Uh, And then we're also going to talk about some whiskeys that I've never had around the holidays, but I tasted them, and I'm like, this tastes very holiday-esque. So I need to rinse my mouth out with a little bit of water before I start drinking this Jameson, uh, because I just ate dinner a little bit earlier. I want to have a good palate for this. I haven't had Jameson Black Barrel since last year. I basically get it every year around the holidays, um, and we'll explain why. All right, I'm rinsed out with some water. I'm going to pull this cellophane off of the bottle or whatever that is. Is that cellophane technically? The plastic on the top? I don't know, but I'm excited. All right, I've got my glass poured. Once again, this is Jameson Black Barrel. Now, if you've heard me talk about it, you've probably heard me say, I think Jameson Black Barrel is most certainly worth the money to move up from your usual Jameson. And I will look up the details about it. I might use my phone for that, actually. Uh, But I will look that up. But I personally do think that Black Barrel, it does have a different character than just Jameson, so I don't want to make it sound like it's just better Jameson. But it definitely is a step up in terms of the amount of flavor and the reduction in alcohol burn. Now, it is only 80 proof, right? 80 proof? Yes, it is. 40% alcohol by volume. But man, it's just got a good flavor to it. And you can probably tell that I'm like excited to dive into this. So I am, in fact, going to do that. Honestly, honestly, maybe this is a good holiday whiskey in terms of the flavor as well, because it kind of has a sugar cookie type smell to it. Definitely a little bit of a caramel. Um, and I think that's that's the note that's always really stood out to me. Um, but definitely a little bit of like a sugar cookie as well. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a sip of it here, too. First of all, I know it's only 40% alcohol by volume, but we're talking extraordinarily low alcohol burn. Like, I mean, it is only 80% ABV, but in my opinion, the word smooth, you know, getting tangled up in my wires here, the word smooth gets thrown around kind of a lot. This is smooth in my opinion. And what I mean by that is it's got a lot of flavor for not very much burn, and I'm a big fan of that. I'm going to take another sip. Maybe even a little bit of a banana flavor, honestly, which I've never caught before. But I'm wondering if that caramel, ooh, this isn't banana specifically, but it might have a touch of banana. But you know what it's kind of reminding me of right now is like a creme brulee. Almost a little bit custardy. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind this is desserty. A little touch of a spice like a cinnamon. Um, everything I'm describing sounds like it'd be great for the holidays. So maybe that's, you know, one reason why I do like it for the holidays. The main reason though, is the story behind it. And I'm going to tell you that story as I look up the details for Jameson Black Barrel. So the reason that I like Jameson Black Barrel, it started as a holiday whiskey for me, not because I thought this tastes like a holiday whiskey, but actually because my dad was gifted a bottle near the holidays And I think it was like maybe even just the week before Christmas. And I was very new to whiskey at the time. I was barely legal drinking age at this time, I'm pretty sure. And I hadn't really been into neat whiskey a whole lot. Uh, This is after the main staples that I always mention kind of got me into whiskey. This is after that. But this is definitely, definitely not to the point where I had my own whiskey collection yet. So this is not where I had started buying bottles and keeping them on my shelf. Uh, Whiskey selection. I know some people don't like the term collection. So my dad gets gifted this bottle. We try it. And he, at this point, also is 
pretty new in terms of uh, the types of whiskey that he's had. He's stuck mostly to Jack Daniels and then to bourbon if it's not Jack Daniels. But we both try this and we're like, this is pretty good. This does not taste like Jameson Jameson. This tastes different. So we liked it. And of course, since he was gifted around the holidays, we drank several glasses of it around the holidays that year. It was kind of like the go-to bottle. Neither of us had a selection yet. So it was like our go-to bottle at the time. And because of that, it accidentally became this sentimental holiday whiskey. And so then when the, when I came back to the bottle and I tried it later, I'm like, oh my gosh, this tastes like Christmas. Like it just, it's the same thing as when you're at the store, you smell something random, you just catch a whiff of it and you're in your second grade classroom or whatever. It was that, except it was with the previous Christmas. So for that reason, it became a very Christmassy beverage for me. I forgot to apologize for my voice. I'm still getting over being sick a little bit. So uh, if I'm clearing my throat a lot, that's why. But at any rate, it had become this sentimental holiday whiskey for me. And for that reason, my dad and I started getting it around the holidays because we're like, this is great. This reminds us of the holidays. Not to mention on top of that, it has all these very... I always knew it was very sweet, very caramely to me. Um, But now that I'm really digging in and really doing a review review of it, I can honestly say I I think it does have holiday-esque notes to it. Uh, So I'm actually excited by that because I never really looked at it that way. I always just thought I'm just sentimental about it. Now let's talk about what Jameson Black Barrel is according to their website. I'm not going to go through the flavor notes yet, um, but I'm just going to talk about what like what it is, the little description that they give here. Jameson Black Barrel, double charring the wood, fires up the barrels and gives them new life. Untold richness and complexity awaits in every drop of Jameson Black Barrel. It's perfect on its own or on the rocks, but it's also commonly known as the best whiskey for an old-fashioned. I will be putting that to the test. I have not heard that, so I'm trying it. (laughs) Don't trust us? Taste it. So care to meet our beloved Black Barrel Whiskey. So I'm learning this as you're learning it, by the way, because I've always just drank this bottle. I've never, like, researched it. Uh double charring the wood so that's the name for black barrel i'm guessing is that they're double charring the wood what is jameson black barrel triple distilled blend of small grain small batch grain and single pot still irish whiskey matured in double charred barrels this whiskey boasts sweet and spicy characteristics that makes sense so it's double charred oak you're getting a little bit extra char on it that's going to give you a little bit more of that oak uh sweetness because it's going to get more interaction but also a little bit of that barrel spiciness that it can get sometimes also it said single pot still and grain whiskey so grain whiskey so single pot still is made in a pot still uh, and has its own specific rules grain whiskey for me typically gives this white sugary flavor i've talked about it before um the nika coffee still uh grain whiskey i think that has a very very white sugar flavor to it and this has a little bit of that so i can see that there's a little bit of the the grain whiskey in it but i typically don't like that flavor too much the pot still i think is really diluting the um it's not ethanol, but there's kind of a bitterness that I get from a grain whiskey. It's kind of diluting that bitterness. So you're getting that nice sugary glaze sweetness along with, which I think maybe is like that sugar cookie I'm describing, along with this depth and body of the pot still notes. It, and if you haven't caught on yet, I'm incredibly biased. I love this whiskey. I'm going to talk about how much I like it for the majority of the episode. Uh, and we will circle back and I'll do a, a last thoughts on it and walk through the notes that they say you should get. But... I'm very biased, so just just know that. But I'm pretty sure this bottle is like $33 or $35. Some, it's in the 30s, and that's a great price, in my opinion, for this whiskey. It is only 80 proof. That's probably one of the big driving factors behind it being so inexpensive. Mm. The more I taste it, the more I would say kind of a custard with a little bit of spice to it, a little bit of like if you had a custard, custard pie or a... Um, what I just say, what's the the custard with the creme brulee? Thank you. Nobody, you know, I'm pointing at the camera here. Uh, if I had a creme brulee that had the cinnamon on top, a little bit of a salt on top to like 
to add a little bit of saltiness to make it grab your jaws a little bit. And then there's like a touch. Obviously, I don't think you'd put this on your creme brulee. But there's a touch of like a black pepper. And it's just a little. Because when I say black pepper, sometimes I'm talking about whiskeys that have a full spice cabinet, like a rye spice. This is like a touch. It's just like a, it keeps you enticed a little bit. So we're going to keep stepping on it. I'm excited to see how that opens up. I will get into some of my favorite holiday whiskeys. Now, these are just a few. And once again, if anything to you feels more like a holiday whiskey, then go with that. Like, I'm not trying to say that these are the best holiday whiskeys. What I'm saying is these all, for very different reasons, have holiday-esque flavors that I think makes them really good. So I'm going to set Jameson Black Barrel off to the side here. Get these cords out of the way. I know I'm going to knock my mic over while I do this. We're setting Jameson Black Barrel off to the side. I will come back to you, Jameson. Now, I'm going to get started on whiskeys that to me taste like the holidays. Full disclosure, the first two are hard to get. The first one is really hard to get. The second one is kind of hard to get, but there's more to the story. So the first one, this one can be really hard to get, but Watershed's Fall Finishing Series, they're Nochino Finished Bourbon. So this is a bourbon that they take, and they finish it in Nochino barrels. Nochino is a oh, Italian, I want to say Italian, liqueur made with walnuts, it's kind of like a bitters. It's kind of like if you've ever, I'm, I, for, I don't know how to pronounce this word. I think it's apertif or apertif. I don't really know. The word for the, the very bitter whiskeys, or not whiskeys, the very bitter liquors that um, people will drink after a meal is like a palate cleanser. If you've ever had one of those, if you know what I'm talking about, it is similar to that. It has the bitterness to it. Maybe it actually is that. I don't really know. I'm not a Nochino expert. I am an expert on this, though, because I've had – this is my second bottle of it. I love this stuff. Um, watersheds bourbon finished in Nochino barrels. That Nochino gives it a little bit of like a a nutty – spicy in a, in the baking spice kind of way flavor to it that to me reminds me so much of like candied nuts um but it's a little it's dark it's kind of candied nuts with a little bit of a bitterness maybe almost like a plum um but overall candied nuts is like the word for this that's what that's what this reminds me of the most and as if you've ever had candied nuts you can understand why this makes it a great fall and winter drink. It's also pretty high proof, so it's really good when it's cold outside. Overall, I love this. Now, it is hard to get your hands on, which is why I'm just kind of going to gloss past it here. Um, but they do have a lottery every year for a right to buy it. So they'll have a lottery. They post it on their Instagram. So if you go follow them on Instagram, this year's lottery is already over, uh, but you can get into it next year. And they have a lottery where you can win the right to purchase a bottle of it because it's hard to find, um, which I like because you're purchasing it for their price. So I, I like that you know it makes it a little bit accessible, I guess, in that way. Uh, this is aged for five years, and this year's batch is... 60 oh 120.9 proof it said it looks like it says 20.9 i think it's because of the, the ink is smudged but 60.5 percent alcohol by volume or 20 point 120.9 proof not 20.9 proof and this is only their fourth batch of it so i think that's fantastic i've talked about it multiple times i like to support my semi-local places as well these guys are in columbus um and i think it's fantastic i think they did something pretty unique I haven't had anything else finished in Nochino that I'm aware of, and so for that reason, I think it deserves some kudos. Bottle number two here. So this bottle specifically is very hard to get your hands on uh, because it's my barrel pick. So there's only like 200 bottles total. I don't know how many are left by the time this airs. I don't know if it, it may have sold out. I'm recording this in advance, as you might imagine. If it hasn't sold out, I will put a link down below so you guys can get your hands on it. However... If you can't get your hands on it, this is a barrel pick of Hard Truth's Sweet Mash Rye. And it does have similar notes to just the run of the mill Hard Truth Sweet Mash Rye, which is why I'm including it. Because normal Hard Truth Sweet Mash Rye also has notes that I think are great for the holidays. My barrel pick, I think personally, I picked this with that one dude, Ryan, and we were both talking about it. We thought. It really accentuated the holiday dessert notes 
that the -the run-of-the-mill Sweet Mash Rye already had. So for that reason, this definitely makes my list of holiday whiskeys, specifically the barrel pick, but also just the -the run-of-the-mill. So the -the run-of-the-mill, you can expect a good amount of graham crackery, baking spice notes, a tiny touch of like the herbal, not really herbal, but black peppery type of notes, and a a good amount of sweetness, more sweetness than you might expect from other rye whiskeys. Um, sweetness in the way of almost like a pastry to me. Now my barrel pick specifically has all that. It has, in my opinion, more of the pastry type sweetness, a little bit of a dark chocolate cocoa type note. And then the thing that for me really makes it a holiday dessert, it has a fair amount of dark fruit, almost plummy type of notes that make it kind of like a holiday, like spiced fruit pie, like a a type of pie that would have fruit and baking spices and that sort of a thing. It reminds me of that a lot. So that's why I'm using my barrel pick for this episode. But to be clear, the sweet mash rye, run of the mill stuff also could be a good holiday option in my personal opinion. Um, and I'm just realizing I didn't actually grab any just bourbons, but I think it's because I like I like wacky finishes and different things around the holidays because I'm drinking bourbon all year round. Maybe that's why. Maybe that's just in my brain. Um, so yeah. At any rate, this is a bourbon finished in Nochino barrels, the the watershed one. So hard truth distilling sweet mash rye. It's gonna give you a lot of the pastry esque notes that you would have in some of your holiday desserts. And that's one of the reasons that I enjoy it so much. Now I got to decide which one I'm going to move to next. Okay. I'm going to move to Lafroy next. You might be thinking, what this is, this tastes nothing like a holiday dessert. You'd be right. Lafroy 10 year tastes nothing like a dessert that you would drink or that you would eat around the holidays. It does, however, have a great palette for like a wintertime bonfire or by the fireplace inside type of a drink. I've mentioned before, there's a lot of Islas and a lot of peated scotches that I do like. I'm still really learning about them. I also like Arbeg 10 year. If you prefer that, that could be a replacement. I also like Lagavulin 16 year. If you prefer that, that could be a replacement. However, the reason I chose Laphroaig for this episode is that Laphroaig specifically has a more earthy, almost leafy taste to it that in the fall leading into the winter, in my opinion, it's a little bit more appropriate. It has a little bit less of the citrus and the salt and the sea spray that the others have, which to me make them really good late winter into springtime drinks. And this has a little bit more of the earthiness that almost makes it a little bit better of a winter drink in my that that's full personal opinion. And so that's why I think the other two uh, could be better options depending on your personal palate. And Laphroaig is hard for some people to drink. I get that. I would just be amiss if I didn't include some peated scotch for a holiday drink. A lot of people love peated scotches in the wintertime. Laphroaig is a great example of a peated scotch. Uh, and then, so for those of you who don't know, the other two that I just mentioned are also peated scotches, Lagavulin 16 year and Ardbeg 10 year. There are other peated scotches as well that there are a lot that I haven't explored at all. So in general, a peated scotch, if you like those smoky, earthy, leafy, bonfire, ashy type of notes, then I think they make a great drink in the, the fall and the winter time, if you're into that. I got I really got to clarify that because some people will try and be like, this is disgusting. And you might be one of those people. That's okay. The next one that I'm moving to is a newer one for me. I actually just recently bought the bottle. Um, I had known for a while that people do like it kind of this time of year, or at least a couple of people that I specifically had spoken with. And so I bought it at dinner. I tried a glass of it and I was like, okay, I'm going to splurge and I'm going to buy the whole bottle. This is a little bit of a splurge, but it is available like everywhere. Angel's Envy, I shouldn't say like everywhere, it's available a lot of places. There are some places that you can't get your hands on it. Angel's Envy's rye, they're finished rye. So this is a rye whiskey that is finished in Caribbean rum casks. And you might be thinking, well, that's going to be super duper tropical and summery. It is. It does have some tropical fruit-esque notes to it, but it's not super duper summery. I actually think it has a really, really nice caramely front on the palate with some of that tropical fruit 
that once again pairs nicely with kind of your holiday desserts has a little bit of a spice to it. I'd almost compare this if it had to be a holiday dessert to like a peach cobbler. Oh, I should compare all of these to holiday desserts, which I will now do after I do the last one. I'm going to come up with that off the cuff, so it's going to be tough, but I think that'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, anyways, Angel's Envy Rye has those type of a notes where it almost reminds me of a peach cobbler. You get a little bit of a spice. Once again, it still entices you. It's still fun, um, but it, it has a lot of sweetness. This is maybe the most sweet okay it's the second most sweet heavy drink that we're going to talk about um jameson might be similarly sweet heavy but i think for jameson it's more so a lack of the alcohol burn so i don't want to say that uh but the next one that we're going to go to is probably even sweeter um but angel's envy finished rye specifically the finished rye not just angel's envy the bourbon that's finished in port wine barrels this is the rye that's finished in caribbean rum barrels definitely a super desserty type of flavor and last but certainly not least glenn morangi's quinta reuben this is once again very sweet so this is probably the sweetest one on the list here this is a scotch whiskey that is finished in ruby port casks make sure it's ruby port oh it just says port but i think Okay, it is Ruby Port. It says it in like smaller print. So it's aged in American oak bourbon casks and then finished in Ruby Port casks. So what what does that tell you? The American oak casks, bourbon casks specifically, give it a nice spiciness, a nice sweetness. We talked about when I had Tim, the whiskey influencer on the show, that you get a, um, especially when it's there for a very long time, it starts to give this very sweet, almost fruity flavor for a lot of scotches. However, when you take it out of that and then you put it in ruby port barrels, now you've got something different going on. And this, I've said multiple times before, reminds me of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I know that that is not dessert for the holidays <laughs> but it also i think to a lot of people doesn't taste like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich that's just what my weird brain associated it with what it does taste like it does have a nice deep fruitiness it does have a little touch of a cocoa flavor and it has a lot of the maltiness that makes it like bready that's the best way i can describe it like a bready taste to it um, but it could be good bready where you have like a peach cobbler, like I mentioned with uh, the Angel's Envy. A peach cobbler has all that uh, breadiness on top of it. It's kind of like that type. It's very desserty, very sweet. I would almost say, I know that my barrel pick is a rye and that this is a single malt. And they are going to taste extremely different. But I would almost say in terms of the type of dessert that, that they remind me of, uh, the Glen Morangi Quinta Rubin is a much more sweet version of what my barrel pick kind of reminds me of. Because the barrel pick is definitely slightly on the drier side. It kind of reminds me of a dry red wine sometimes. And I can get that a little bit from the run of the mill sweet mash rye as well. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, I guess, another point about that is the, the red wine point. But the Glen Morangi Quinta Rubin is almost like a super sweet, super bready um, I guess sweet's the best way. I mean, best way for me to describe it. It's 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 very sweet on your palate. Um, so that for that reason, I think it goes nicely with a dessert. Now, if I had to say that each of these was a holiday dessert, off the cuff, I'm just making this up right now. I'm gonna say Jameson Black Barrel is maybe a custard, maybe a sugar cookie, almost kind of both in my opinion. So maybe like a custard pie that has a nice sweet sugary crust. Um, then the next one, the Nochino barrel, I said it already, the Nochino finished bourbon, candied nuts. I mean, this, this is like glazed cinnamon sugar, walnuts and pecans. That's what it reminds me of. The barrel pick reminds me specifically of a fruit pie that has like a, like probably, I know you don't make fruit pies with a graham cracker crust, but that's kind of what it reminds me of. So it reminds me of a fruit pie plus graham crackery ness. That's what the barrel pick reminds me of. Lafroig is going to be the hardest one to do because it doesn't really remind me of a dessert. Um, the quote unquote dessert that it reminds me of is any dessert eaten by a fire in the winter time with a coat on. You're bundled up. Um, maybe I'll. Uh, what is something that kind of fits that vibe? 
Not a dessert, but it could be your dessert. A dessert cigar. That's what it reminds me of. It's like you're having a cigar for dessert. It's got it doesn't have that same type of smokiness as a cigar, but it has like smokiness. It has the warmth of it. It has the earthiness, the tobacco notes. That's what it reminds me of. That's that's my best comparison on such short notice. I didn't tell myself that I was gonna have to do this for the podcast. Angels Envy finished rye. What does there? Ooh, I'm gonna have to smell that one. I've only had it a few times. I'm gonna smell it real quick and, and think about that. I know I had said peach cobbler when I was describing it, but it's not so peachy as it is something else, like a lighter fruit, a little bit more sugary. Definitely some caramel there. Ah, peach cobbler might be the best thing I can come up with thinking about this. Maybe like a. Mm, Maybe like a tiny touch of cranberry. I don't know for sure, though. I guess I'm sticking with peach cobbler. I don't know. Glen Morangi Quinta Rubin. Now, obviously, this reminds me a ton of peanut butter and jelly sandwich, because that's what I always say. I'm going to smell it and try to think of a different dessert. I don't know what dessert would have like a plummy flavor to it, but it's almost like a plummy... Um, Maybe a touch of cranberry. Kind of reminds me of, of a cranberry and wine that I drink. Um, maybe a little bit of both of those. I think the best I can do is like a a spiced jam that you might have around the holidays on like a toast or maybe put it on crackers. I don't really know. I mean, I've, I've had jam on crackers. I don't know if anybody else does that or if I'm just weird. That's kind of that's kind of the direction that that's leading me. So maybe like a spiced jam with a little bit of a toast. Definitely a touch of a chocolate, which is what really throws me for a loop and makes it pretty different. But uh, oh, I sorry for screaming into the mic if that was a little bit of a scream. Ah, uh, I figured it out. I figured out a great one for this. Um, there's a cookie that we make. We call them Romanian tea cookies, but when I looked them up, it didn't say Romanian tea cookies online. So I've seen just thumbprint cookies. But specifically, the recipe that we have says Romanian tea cookies, and they have this very sweet, extremely brown sugary dough for the cookies. And you press your thumb into them, and you fill that with jam, and then you bake it, and then it's like a you know cookie that has jam in the middle. I guess that's that's all that I can describe it as. And it has that. That's a great description because it's very brown sugary, so it's got a little bit of this molasses, this darkness to it, and then it's also got jam. Now, if you were to put a spiced jam in the center of it, I think Glen Morangi Quinta Rubin. That's that's what it's tasting like. Uh, that ooh, that might be like the bo- most accurate one, aside from the spiced nuts, the candied nuts, because the Watershed Nocino is spot on. But the next best comparison might be the the Quinta Rubin with that cookie because that's what it reminds me of. So, yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, I think that's a pretty pretty fair comparison. I'm going to get these all out of the way so that I don't knock them over one more time for you guys who are who are trying to figure out where you're going to go to the store and buy. We've got Jameson Black Barrel. We've got Watershed's Bourbon Finished in Nochino Barrels. We've got Hard Truth Distilling's Sweet Mash Rye, if it's still available, specifically my barrel pick in my personal opinion. Uh, Lafroig Tenure. Angels Envy Rye Finished in Caribbean Rum Casks, and Glenmorangie's Quinta Rubin. Those are the ones that I'm recommending in this episode for very different reasons. And I tried to really cover a lot of ground for that reason so that, like, there's kind of something for everybody. But now i got to get them out of my way because I talk with my hands and I will knock them over. We want just Jameson, and we want Jameson to be in a safe location where I won't knock it over and break it. Okay, I'm going to take another sip of this wrap up my thoughts on it, and then we'll go through the the notes that Jameson says you should get from Jameson Black Barrel. And maybe maybe one last kind of disclaimer about holiday whiskeys, kind of wrapping up my thoughts on holiday whiskeys. On that round of sipping, I got way more of the spices, which really amped it up a little bit and made it a little bit more enticing. I'm a big fan of that. Um, but yeah, still, still for sure a custardy sugar cookie-y flavor. That's the best way for me to describe it. That's what it reminds me of. I could be wrong. I mentioned a touch of banana and definitely some caramel. Um, We're going to see how wrong I am. Maybe almond. Maybe, maybe a touch of almond is a good note to throw out there as well. Now let's see how wrong I am when I look up these notes. On the nose, it says... 
Time spent maturing in these barrels lead to intensified aromas of butterscotch, fudge, and creamy toffee. Let me tell you something. When I read butterscotch, I was like, boom, spot on. Yes, butterscotch is a great one. Fudge and creamy toffee, it's not that dark to me. It doesn't have that dark of notes to it. I could kind of see toffee a little bit, though. But to, to just just for my palate, based on the other stuff that I drink, I'm not seeing those those dark chocolatey notes like fudge. Taste. Nutty notes are in abundance alongside the smooth sweetness of spice and vanilla. I'm absolutely with you on the spice and vanilla. Not overly nutty to me. I will take another sip and I will. I'm going to do it right now because now I need to think about this. But not overly nutty. For sure, almondy. Like I said, almond earlier. But that's like the only nut that I would say. So not to me much of a walnut or a peanut, but a little bit of a an almond, I think. So that could be the nuttiness. Um, I really wish they would have went somewhere with a custard or a pudding type note because it reminds me of that a lot. They don't mention it at all, and I kind of wish they did. Spice and vanilla, though, I did mention creme brulee with spices on top of it. So kind of that, but... I wish they would have specifically called out custard because that's what it reminds me of. And for the finish, it just says, enjoy the richness and intensity of toasted wood and vanilla. Sure, that's accurate. The vanilla lingers around. A little bit of the spice sticks around. Maybe they're calling that the toasted wood. I think that's a fair take. But I do disagree on the nose. They went a little bit darker than I would have went with the fudge and the toffee. Uh, and then on the palate, I wish they would have brought up a, a custard of some sorts. I do want to do a quick price comparison as well of this versus your standard Jameson. So let's look here. Jameson Irish whiskey. Whenever it wants to load. Jameson Irish whiskey. $27 for a bottle of Jameson. Okay. Now we're going to go to Jameson Black Barrel. We said $27 for normal Jameson. Jameson Black Barrel is $34. Seven more dollars. And in my opinion, this is worth every penny of seven more dollars. To me, this has a lot more character and a lot more going on than just standard Jameson. And here's the funny thing. I like standard Jameson. So like, I'm not dissing it. Um, I especially like leagues above proper 12. I like standard Jameson. Um, but Jameson Black Barrel to me is significantly uh, more fun. It's got more character to it. It's got more going on. And I also wanted to see, they said, I think, how long it's aged. It's aged for up to 16 years. You're not supposed to say up to. You're supposed to say whatever the youngest thing is in it. But uh, they probably get away with it because they specifically put up to. Up to 16 years in double charred barrels, making it a full strength whiskey. So they don't say what the youngest whiskey is in here, which is a little tricky. Be careful of that. I don't like that they do that. I wish they, I don't care if this is two years old. Just tell me. I don't see an age statement anywhere else. So do with that information what you will. <clears throat> but uh, I definitely think it's still worth the extra money. That's my thoughts on Jameson Black Barrel. I, I could talk about it all day long. And like I said, I'm so uh, biased. I don't know what word I want. Jealous? I wanted to say the word jealous. That doesn't make any sense. I'm so biased that... <clears throat> I I can't give an unbiased, I can't give a fair review because this to me tastes like the holidays right now. If I had to give it any bad notes, and mind you, this is only $34, uh, I think it doesn't have a ton of flavor. It doesn't jump out of the glass at you with flavor, but I'm also used to drinking significantly higher proof stuff. So maybe I wish it had some more flavor to it. I don't think it necessarily has all of the depth in the world you get some nice flavors it's definitely bolder than normal jameson definitely more character than normal jameson but that's compared to normal jameson you compare this to something with a lot of character like a green spot or a red breast 12 year or a red breast cask strength this doesn't have that much body this doesn't have that much flavor um but in that you know 34 dollar range i think it has some pretty good flavor what else I don't know. That's all I can really say. It's very welcoming. It's got a little bit of a spice enough to keep me enticed. And personally, I recommend it, obviously, because I'm very biased. So this is this is my Christmas time bottle. Of course, I have other Christmas time bottles. Uh, I mentioned I will be drinking the Watershed No Chino probably on Christmas Day. Um, and then I also will be drinking my Hard Truth Pick around that time as well, probably on Christmas Day. Um, 
I guess I'm going to have to be a little bit picky with which of these I drink, but also Christmas Day is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, you take small sips with various different people. And that's actually the next point that I wanted to get to. Look at that. I came full circle by accident. Drinking whiskey around the holidays and, and holiday whiskeys and what to do about it, right? So I already mentioned you can go the sentimental route. You can go, this reminds me of the holidays. On the other hand, you can go the route of this tastes like the holidays. This tastes like a holiday dessert. Regardless of all that, in my personal opinion, the most important part of it, the thing that you remember once it's sentimental, the thing that it takes you back to once uh, you have that, that sentimentality for the whiskey, it's going to take you back to who you were drinking it with, what you were talking about when you were drinking it, and the people, the time that you shared, and the holidays. So the reason I say that is to say some of these are more expensive bottles, some of these are less expensive bottles. Obviously, don't stretch yourself too thin. Don't go out buying yourself something crazy expensive and getting rid of it over the holidays. But also buy something that's within your means that you're happy to share with people, that you won't be angry at them for drinking too much of it. If your crazy uncle or cousin or whatever comes up to you and mixes it with Coke, you're not going to be mad at him. That's not what any of this is about. So this is just me speaking from the heart here. I think it's very important to make sure you are bringing bottles around on the holidays that other people are going to enjoy. If you have whiskey lovers in your life, obviously some people don't. Um, and then enjoy those bottles with those people. That makes this whole thing more fun. So do that. The next thing, as I kind of mentioned, I'm going to be drinking a couple different kinds on Christmas. Try not to get too intoxicated. Uh, some of these are a little bit stronger. I purposefully, I, I specifically, will be trying not to get intoxicated. I might even have to be DD that day. Uh, and that brings me to my next point is do not drink and drive. So if I'm DD, I will be having one glass and then driving to wherever I'm going. And then one glass and then driving to wherever I'm going. And this will be over the course of hours. And for me, glasses are not big glasses. Um, I personally am the type, I'm very, 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 very careful with drinking and driving because it's just so not worth it to me. So please don't drink and drive. I can't say it enough. It's one of those things that I'm just like, it's not cool. It's very frustrating. That's my plug against drinking and driving. Don't drink and drive. Drink responsibly. Try not to drink too much. You don't want to be making a fool of yourself. You don't want to be stepping in the bowl of eggnog because you were dancing on the table. You don't want to be that guy at Christmas. So don't do that. Drink responsibly. Enjoy the people that you're drinking it with. And most importantly, have a Merry Christmas if you celebrate it. Enjoy your holiday season. Enjoy the time that you are going to have with the people around you. And for those of you who celebrate it once again, Merry Christmas. God bless you guys. Have a great New Year. That's all that I can say about all these holiday whiskeys. Um, if you have other holiday whiskeys that you really like, please, please let me know. I'm always down to try some new whiskeys that people say have holiday flavors to them. I think it's super exciting. I think it's a lot of fun. Let me know about them. Maybe I'll give them a try. <clears throat> Maybe they'll make it into next year's episode. Who knows? But nevertheless, drink responsibly. Enjoy the people that you drink it with. Learn to drink and drink to learn. I will talk to you guys next time. Thank you guys for listening to another episode of Whiskey Noobs. If you need more Whiskey Noobs content in your life, make sure you check out our Patreon page in the show notes. And if you like the show, please make sure to leave a five-star rating or review. It only takes a couple of minutes, and they're way more helpful than people realize. If you want to do tastings alongside the show, make sure you join the email list by sending an email to whiskeynoobspodcast at gmail.com with a subject line that says email list. You'll receive monthly emails with a list of the whiskeys that will be featured throughout the month so that you can buy them ahead of of time. You can also find more Whiskey Noobs content on Instagram at Whiskey underscore Noobs and on TikTok at Whiskey Noobs Podcast. Once again, thank you guys for listening. The Whiskey Noobs Podcast does not support underage or otherwise irresponsible consumption of alcohol.